Okay, so we're ready for our next session. And today we have Dr. Flavia Belpoliti from Texas A&M Commerce. And I am very happy to introduce her today. Flavia Belpoliti is Assistant Professor of Spanish and Director of the Spanish Graduate Studies at the Department of Literature and Languages at Texas A&M University Commerce. Her research interests involve Spanish as a second language and Spanish as a heritage language, pedagogy, sociolinguistics, Spanish in the US, and discourse analysis. Her latest publications focus on curriculum design and project-based and service learning implementations in heritage language courses. Her upcoming book, co-authored with Encarna Bermejo, focuses on writing development of Spanish heritage learners at the beginning level. Born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Flavia has been calling Texas home for about 15 years. So please help me in welcoming Flavia Belpoliti. Thank you, Joseli. Um, before we start, I would like to uh, thank Joseli and the whole uh, choral team because of the welcome and, and the facilities and the excellent food we are being enjoying. So thank you, guys. And my presentation today is going to be like a kind of a nexus between what Gabriela presented yesterday and they are presenting uh, in the next session. So um, in the past two years, two years and a half, I become one of the mentors for um, future Spanish teachers and future bilingual teachers in, at the university. So slowly I become very involved in curriculum design for teacher preparation. So my, my main uh, focus here is, is talking about what it means to be a teacher of Spanish as a heritage language. And I think that uh, it's going to work as a kind of connection between some of the concepts and ideas we've been discussing. And we have a lot of work to do, so please be prepared. Uh, the printout includes the first and the last activity. So I want everybody to really do it. So in case you didn't have your computer at hand, I wanted to have this as a printout. And also, at the end, you have a list of resources that I think it will, it will also help to complete some of the, of the material here. And then the other activities are in the uh, folder that I think everybody has access already. So let me just open the document. And the document looks like this. So the first page is the one that you have print out. And the following ones are the ones that are going to complete in the computers when we have uh, the moment for do that. OK, so um, more or less the agenda. So you have an idea how, what we're going to do. Uh, I divided the presentation in three parts. The first and the second part is kind of shorter. And after each section, we will have an activity. So we have like 15 minutes of lecture and then the activity and discussion. And the first part is like talking about our context. Our broad context would mean what's happening with Spanish in the US first. And second, what happened with heritage language education at this point in time. And I think that there have been so many changes in the past 20 years that it could be like a refresh of what's happening with the, with the profession. And then the, the last part is going to be what's happened with us as a teacher of Spanish as a heritage language. And I'm going to focus uh, mainly in the core competencies. And we're going to follow up with what it means to know sociolinguistics to talk about uh, heritage languages. And then I have some results of an ongoing project I can, I'm conducting with uh, Dr. Guinanzetti. And we're doing like a survey across the state. We have just uh, some, some answers so far. But it gives an idea what's happening in the nation regarding our, our teachers. And finally, challenges. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see if the responses that we got are the same that you are uh, facing now. So it's going to be interesting to see that. And at the end, um, my big idea for you is to create an action plan. And hopefully, in a year, we will meet again here and we'll discuss what happened with your, your, your action research plan. OK, uh, let's start with the self-assessment. So in the first page that you have in the printout, um, this is the only individual activity you're going to do. So let's take five, six minutes. OK, guys. Questions? Some question marks in the in the list or uh -huh. uh. <laughs> 
do you make a distinction between the macro approaches, social linguistics, multi and multiliteracies? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and we will see that in slide nine, I think. So we're going to talk about this. I mean, all, all the different topics that you see in this uh, initial activity had to do with the presentation and the areas that we need to keep exploring. Of course, in two hours we cannot cover whole, whole models of pedagogy, but at, the, at least you have the ideas, main names, and with the resources you can start thinking, okay, I think that this is something I'm interested in. Uh, I'm going to read more or hear more about it. Mm -hmm. So in an ideal world, you will have all the always column fill out. <laughs> but I think that none of us is, is able to really cover all the different areas. But at least we know we, we need to think about those. Uh, so let's start just with uh, a little bit of background on what's happening in the United States and what's happening with the Hispanic communities. Most, if not all, of our students are, are coming from here. Uh, so let's start with just demographics, very, very short uh, graphics here. So first of all, the trend of the number of Hispanic people living in the United States, and this data is, is quite new, is from the American uh, Community Survey from 2015, that by the census, and the census released the, the analysis Last two years ago. So we're still hoping to get, of course, to 2020 and see the result of that census. But the trend is quite clear, it's really ascending. And even if you can say that there is a small change in the slope here in between 2010 and 2016, still the number of Hispanic people in the state keeps growing. And the second thing that I want to, you to consider is that that growth is also a growth for diversification our communities are becoming more diverse. Of course, Mexican and Mexican descent people represent 64%, but used to be more near to 75. So there is a change here that is interesting. And then you have more people coming from Central and South America and being from, born from families that came from this area. Puerto Ricans, and it will be very interesting to see what's happening after the hurricanes. You will see an increase overall in, in the United States of Puerto Rican people moving here. Then you have other Hispanic populations, and Cubans just representing the 4%. So for our classes, that means that our communities probably is going to be not just Mexican dialects, but we'll have to be able to hear and understand dialects from all these different uh, parts. More information about the, the Hispanic communities. And this has to do with the use of the Spanish language. What's happening with this? Uh, this is a very nice chart, and you will say this is impressive. Again, from the uh, American Community Survey, there is a report that 40.5 million people speak Spanish at home, which makes uh, in the United States the second country after, after Mexico regarding number, raw numbers of, of speakers. Uh, so they will see, okay, we have a lot of people sharing this language here. But what's happening here, and this is uh, also a very nice chart from the Pew Research Center, that even if we have these uh, huge raw numbers for the people ascending, the reality is that the proficiency in the language is decreasing. And this is a very interesting uh, opposition because as proficiency in English rises, and you can see from 2000 to 2013, uh, the same people that are responding are showing that there is a descent in proficiency in Spanish. Meaning what? Meaning that by the next 10 years, we're going to have more students that are at the intermediate and basic level of Spanish as a heritage language. And this was being, I mean, foretold by, by several researchers. Uh, Maria Carrera was saying that, yes, that in the, in the next 15 years, mostly our classes for heritage learners should focus in second and third generation students. And that means that they're going to have a higher proficiency in English, in English now that they have now and a lower proficiency in Spanish. So we have to be prepared and start preparing for those students. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, third chart. Um, what's happening with our Hispanic uh, students at the different education levels? And again, this is overall national trends. Uh, I think that this is a very uh, interesting and positive chart. We have more 
Hispanic students enrolling in public schools overall. And you can see the changes in this, uh, in this decade. So basically, we move up by six points. And we are basically the most advancing uh, minority group. And this is another interesting fact. And I was, I've been thinking about it. What is the meaning that there is a descent of white Anglo students in public schools? There is less enrollment, or they're moving to private schools, probably so. So uh, I think that the, the end result is that, again, we're going to have more diversity in our classes. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this data in this chart is, is quite positive. I, I'm very happy with this, and I, I hope that, I mean, we can see this number increasing and more uh, Hispanic students enroll in school and stay in school and graduate, because the next chart shows that the graduation rate is below the national uh, average. So you can see here, very interesting, the overall 84% of students that begin schooling in the US graduate from high school. And we are above the other minorities, but still we are below the national, the national level. So there's something to consider what's happening with this, with this distance here, and what's happening with our students, not only in our classes, but overall in their performance, academic performance. And I think that there have been a relevant effort, and we need to continue with that, to increase this gap in, in, in attainment and, and achievement of, of graduation. So we have like, a, I think that the, the, all the data that, that, that is here shows like a mixed landscape. So we have data that is very positive, data that is not that positive, language is still there and is growing, the use of Spanish at the same time, proficiency of English seems to increase and impact proficiency in Spanish. So we have a, like a complex uh, system uh, working here for, for our students. Uh, this, uh, this was not going to be part of the presentation. Uh, when we start talking with Joseli about the topic and with Gabriela and, and, and Jose. Uh, but I think that we need to have a time and a space to discuss a little bit the issues that are currently happening regarding the Spanish language in the United States. So let's start with uh, some clips. Uh, hopefully we work. Thank you. 
So Spanish as a threat is no new, but all the videos that we just saw from this year. Uh, we have an historical movement from a very early history, particularly with the American-Mexican War. Spanish was construct as a threat. But those ideas that represent that there is one government, one flag, and one language, that monolingual ideology uh, still persists, I mean, after how many years? Uh, so we have contemporary expressions after the 70s, 80s, so after the civil rights movements, at the rise of, of minorities as a part, a relevant part of the uh, American experience. Uh, so from the 80s on, we have different movements. For, in, for instance, everybody's familiar with English only movement, um, anti migration sentiments and policies that target speaking language other than English, and of course, stereotype-based attitudes and also actions, because the videos we just saw are actually not just attitudes, those are current, actual actions uh, against people that speak Spanish. So there is this uh, complex situation of what to do if we see this circulating in the mass media, in the social media, and we have a student that speak Spanish at home where their families maybe don't speak English at all. What happened with them? So I will have five minutes for you to discuss with someone else this, this question. Uh, what happened with our students with this position of a society that considers Spanish a threat? Entonces, uh, alguien, uh, alguno de los grupos quiere, quiere compartir alguna idea, algún comentario. Um, pues yo sé que con este tema uh, we could spend the whole the whole day talking. <laughs> yeah. um, as far as what this means for us, we were saying that that's why it's so important in our classes to make them feel proud because they're getting a message everywhere else to not be proud of their language. And also that, um, especially in places that don't have such a high Hispanic population, maybe this class is their only place where they feel safe. comfortable and at home and safe. So that's kind of what we talked about. No comments here. Um, I was encouraged, though, out of all of those uh, um, incidents that all of the, the, the Spanish speakers stood up for themselves. They didn't just sort of dis apologize and walk away. They all sort of, they all sort of fought back and said, no, this is, this is who I am, and this is, this is your problem, not mine. Mm -hmm. it, it is sad that even, and she was saying that even in, in this part of Texas, in Central Texas, I had, I've had students tell me that their teachers have told them not to speak uh, Spanish in their classroom. And I remind my students that if you're talking when the teacher's talking, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, don't do it. And they say, no, well, everybody was just hanging out and nobody weren't doing it. I said, well, then that's a different thing. I'm not gonna call one of my coworkers a, a racist, but, and they're like, she's racist. I said, I don't, you know, I wasn't in there. I don't know what she, you know, what the context was, but it, 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 it does happen. And I believe them on some level that there are teachers that are telling them not to speak Spanish in the classroom. So it's, it's really kind of sad. Um, I had one of my colleagues, I was in the l on lunch line for the teacher's cafeteria, and I had a relationship with one of the lunch ladies. Buenos dias, señora Flores, como esta? We would always have a conversation. We'd ask each other about our families and everything. And this older teacher, I didn't know him very well, was right behind me, and he said, uh, that's why they don't learn English, because you insist on, on continuing to speak Spanish to them. And I turned to him and I said, excuse me, I am having a private conversation with this person. Would you mind? And I t turned my back to him. ¿Qué me estaba diciendo, señora? Y seguimos platicando. Uh, the next day, I was back in uh, the lunch line and she said, 
algunas personas tienen muchos títulos, pero no tienen educación. Le dije, muy cierto, señora. So, uh, when we're just discussing, okay, our kids are not learning the accent marks and why they don't kind of conjugate the subjunctive. I think that is important, but if we're going to be heritage language teachers, this is, this, I think that this is more relevant and we need to keep the conversation going. So uh, the activity that follows, if you can go please uh, to page, I think that is page two or three, um, has to do with, with this issue. So uh, it will take like 15 minutes to complete because there are two parts. But please, um, and if you don't have a computer, you can, you can, you can share uh, one of the documents and, and do it together. But I'm very interested in the responses to the second activity. So it will be like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, are we done with these two questions? More or less, yes, no? Uh, I think that it's very interesting the, the, the two options, like what happens if we have students coming to our class saying, I don't want to speak Spanish any longer after reading or listening to these to this, uh, materials. Or the other way around, you can use and you can reconvert those news into material to discuss in class. And we were just with this group uh, talking a little bit about that. Um, and I think that this is an opportunity to start building up critical thinking and critical, which is the basis for critical pedagogy. Uh, to get the, this situation, not like something that is a problem that is happening, which is, it is, but bring into the class like a case study, analyze and start discussing different factors that are showing there. Uh, so it's a way to start a discussion. More ideas on this? No, but you can reconvert this kind of material into uh, discussion points for your heritage cl language class. Okay. Um, let's start with the second context that um, I would like to just talk a little bit about is what's happening with heritage language education. And I think that in the past 20 years, 15 years, the profession has a coming of age. Uh, there is um, particularly a large, relevant, many others working on research in the past uh, 20 years. So the profession didn't start in 2000s, but I think that from that date up, we have a, a very interesting body of research that shows us what we know actually about what the heritage language is and what the heritage language learners are. I think that is fundamental. And the other day we were talking about uh, a little bit uh, with a colleague. Um, we know that and we have this understanding, but still there are many questions and many issues that we need to keep researching and trying in classrooms and then seeing if they're effective or not. So there have been advances in pedagogical approaches. There is, I think, a large differentiation from second language models. And slowly we're building up an what they call an ecological pedagogy for heritage learners. Not only Spanish, but heritage learners at large. Of course, we have many questions still ongoing, and I think that um, there is a lack of long-term studies. That's something that we're missing. And there is uh, some, some, there, there have been some studies trying to prove how effective a, a method or an activity is, but there are still no clear answers to many questions. Like, okay, I want my students to learn and advance their vocabulary. What activities, what tasks are more adequate for that? What are effective? We know we have certain answers, but not like a complete answer. I say, okay, this is it. If you want to get the students to learn the subjunctive, do this in class and you're done. We don't have those answers yet, but I think that the, 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 growing, the, the field is growing on, on, on responding to, this, to these questions. Um, so let's start just reviewing goals. And probably you are familiar with the first four lines of text, which are the uh, traditional or the classical 
goals that uh, Guadalupe Valdez posit for the, for the field. And in the past you know, 15 years, the list has grown. And you can see that there are um, two topics at the end that are more related with communities and cultural understanding and not just language. So we're moving from very language-focused goals to more broad societal, community-based uh, goals. So, um, for instance, maintenance is, is one of the focus has been for a very long period of time. You know that we, languages shift after a third or fourth generation and people become just monolingual in the majority language. Uh, so keeping the language working, it will be one of our goals. Uh, the second, and we've been discussing this when we started with, uh, with um, the guys here this morning, what is the meaning of prestige variety, the general Spanish variety, against all these different dialects that we find in our classrooms. And one of the goals is that they are able to move from that first dialect that they already have, the home dialect, to where a dialect that is recognized as more general. And I like the word general rather than standard or international. There are many labels, but I think that general Spanish meaning that everyone that speaks Spanish could understand you. That would be our goal for second language, second, second dialect acquisition. Uh, third, we have expansion of the bilingual range. And I think that for us, it's very important that we connect with people teaching ESL or TESOL classes. Bilingual means that they need to advance both languages, not only Spanish. And if we consider the data that is available now for the 2015 year regarding number of ESL students, uh, there are about 4.9 million of students that are enrolled in uh, English as a second language classes in elementary but also in high schools. And 77% are Hispanic uh, students that speak Spanish at home. So English is the other language that they have to learn. So we cannot work isolated. We have to be able to communicate with whoever is teaching and working in English and see, okay, how are you managing reading strategies? How are you uh, making your students be more aware of lexical decisions? Uh, and you can both collaborate to create plans, lesson plans that work for both languages. I think that this, this is relevant and it's one of our goals. Uh, transfer literacy skills, of course, meaning that if you learn, the basic is that if you learn to read and write in one language, you can transfer some of those strategies to the, second, to the other language. Uh, there are some discussion how the transfer happens. I think that there is still research needed in that area. But uh, it seems very simple to work with someone and say, OK, if you can understand this in English, and you're using these reading strategies to recognize cognates, make inferences, you can start using that when you read in Spanish. But students have to be uh, aware of those, of, those, of those different strategies. So that's just part of the, of the, of the transfer process. Uh, academic skills, uh, not only are they learning Spanish, they're learning how to study and how to study math, how to study geography. So part of our work is to help students to create like a scholarship uh, perspective on how to, how to learn. And this, according to some others, is going to affect this uh, achievement gap that we see with the Latino population. And these two last um, goals, and those are, of course, very broad, um, involve all heritage languages, has to do with attitudes and had to do with the work that we just did. If we're in a society where there is this push towards monolingualism, and that's the majority ideology work in the system, you have to be able to create a space where students can feel positively dedicated to their heritage language. Becoming proud, I think someone used that word, and I think that this is, is a great word. I mean, you have to be proud that you're speaking Spanish, or Chinese, or Korean, or whichever uh, is your, your heritage language. And, and it has to do also with the context of the school. If you have people saying, you cannot speak Spanish in class because I say so, and because we need to speak American, well, uh, we need to have a conversation with that, with that particular teacher at some point. Uh, and then at the end, the other uh, big goal, and it has to do with the own learners perspectives. Uh, there have been several surveys regarding motivation, attitudes, and, 
ideologies of heritage language learners, particularly in Spanish. And one of the main motives for starting to take heritage language classes, at least at college level, is because they want to become more close to their own culture. They want to know more, not just about, you know, El Quijote or, uh, I don't know, uh, Borges in Argentina, and it's great if they can read and understand Borges, but they feel that they want to connect with their communities and the culture that is happening right now. So topics like uh, historic development of the communities, Latino communities in the United States, topics like uh, literature is written in Spanish and English in the United States, um, art, public art that is done here, that should be the first topics the students start to, to work with in a, in a heritage classroom class. Okay, so yesterday with Gabriela was, was, was explaining the, the creation of the programs, and even if it's just one class, it has to be like a whole program, but it's just the class that you're designing, or even a lesson you're preparing for the class, I think that this should be your background. And of course, we cannot cover all goals at the same time, but when you're planning, say, okay, I want to really, this year, try to focus on literacy skills and how to transfer one side from the other, see how they can do in English and how can we can use that to help with the literacy in Spanish. Uh, or you can say, okay, no, this year I'm going to focus on positive attitudes and start discussing this, these topics in class. Okay. So after these 20 years, I think that there is like a consensus, there is a building up of consensus in the discipline about the approaches. And these are not um, models that you can just go ahead and create an activity. I don't have a, like a direct activity that represents all these, these approaches, but each approaches give us different points of entrance into the different areas that has to do with linguistics, but has to do with attitudes, motivation, affective factors, sociocultural factors. And I think that each of these models brings something that we can really uh, make use of in our classes. So for starters, uh, critical pedagogy, and this is, has become 10 years ago, I will say, 15 years ago, one of the main areas of research and of work, particularly in programs at the university level. Um, it has multiple uh, others working in the model, but the idea is that you're working with languages from a perspective that tries to understand social hierarchies, power, power and how power is used, and how we create with languages attitudes, valoration, stereotypes, and try to deconstruct those. And we're talking with, uh, with Joseli, and there are activities already created by Claudia, right? Claudia Olguin? Mm -hmm. uh, they are created and they are available in, in, in here in Core, so we can check them out. So data you can implement in class that are built up in this in this perspective. Uh, Multiliteracies, and we have one of the experts here <laughs> with us. Uh, basically, the main idea behind this approach is to consider that we make sense in several modes, not only reading and writing. So every time that a student faces a video, a news a picture, they are making meaning, they are creating meaning with that. And the idea of the multi is to start to see how you read and write in an expansive way. Meaning you are producing and you are using and you are reproducing and recreating material that exists. And there are several activities you can implement from just getting the students to know a place, show, take a couple of pictures and write about that place and maybe upload it and share it with the class in, in Facebook. So the idea here is that there is not, and particularly if you think of our life today, I mean, we cannot work only with this, the, 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 the paper, reading and writing. We're doing many more things. You are looking at me, you are looking at the, at the screen, you are seeing pictures, you are seeing images, the size of the words, everything has meaning. So the idea is to help these learners to develop competency in more than one way to make meaning and interpret meaning, of course. Macro approaches, that was the other, the other question since some of you were kind of wondering about this. Um, macro approaches come from, from, from second language acquisition models after the big shift from the methods area to the post-methods area. 
And the idea is that we start to see language in a different way. You cannot just work with building blocks, phonemes, morphemes, words, syntax. We need to know where the subject is. We need to know the verbs. Uh, like separated entities, that was like the old model. But we start working from the top down, meaning you start from the discourse and go to analyze different areas and different ways of using that discourse. And micro approaches involves not just one model. Uh, Carrera mentions five. We can add or probably one or more two. But for instance, if you're working with a genre-based model and you want students to know different genre in Spanish and in English, you're working with a macro approach uh, model. Uh, if you're working with discourse-based, for instance, reading literature or other type of text, you're working with this model. Uh, Project-based, who is working with project-based? Models. One here. <laughs> OK, great. We have three. Hopefully, next year, we'll have like 100 hands. Because Project Base, I think that is a fantastic way to, to, to move forward heritage languages. In our university, our classes, heritage languages, they are all Project based and they do different things. And um, the idea is that they are really the owners of that project, and you are only scaffolding the activities. And the final product normally is a multimedia product. It's not just a paper. It's really a presentation, a poster, uh, a video that they share in, in YouTube. Uh, another macro approach uh, that is I mean, being, being discussed and being, being used is, has to do with experiential or service learning. And I move it down because I think that there are particular characteristics of this project that is related, of course, but I mean, it's, it's kind of different. But macro approaches is try to see the language and communication like a whole. From that whole, we start working with different parts. And the idea of changing one word can modify a whole message and the other way around. So we try to work with that uh, broad perspective. Uh, sociolinguistics, well, we have our presenters this morning, and later on, they will uh, return. But basically, the idea is that concept, basic concept of sociolinguistic can be directly worked in the classroom. And from there, you can start to analyze and get the students to analyze their own production, production from the communities, and then other type of productions. And the, the framework, the concept that we discussed this morning, like a language in contact, dialects, variation, uh, are, are fundamental components of this, of this perspective. And finally, and this is happening every, I mean, there are every, every semester seems that there are more people working in this kind of projects. And I think that the future of profession will have this as an essential component of, of teaching a Spanish for Heritage Learners class is having students to interact directly with their communities or the communities at large. So there are uh, several projects in different institutions. Uh, for instance, Ana Roca was one of the first to start promoting this, this model with the Abuelos project. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, what she did is she created a program where the students, uh, college students, had to go ahead and interview um, abuelos, people from the from the community, they were certain age, and they have to basically through the semester record different interviews, and at the end they have to create like a ethnographic history of that person. So these biographies become the central the central component for the whole class, and every time that the students went to the to the different families, nursing homes, and interviewed these these, these people, they came back with stories, new words, questions. So the whole class was based on, on this big project. And in one way, the student gained knowledge of, OK, the particular life of a particular person. But the person had the opportunity to, to share the, their experience, their life experience. And I think that it's a great project to, to try to, to implement, even when they're of the, their own families. I mean, in, in high school, maybe you don't have access to a nursing home. But each student can directly interview a grandparent, someone that still lives in Mexico, and recreate that story. Uh, there are several projects with um, medical Spanish uh, classes where students basically collaborate with a, a health science uh, professional, doctors, nurses, helping with translation, uh, interpretation, that type of activity, which is more complex. Other projects work with uh, older students, working with younger students, for instance, in a 
after school uh, book club and they read in Spanish and the older students in high school or college create some question and activity for the kids and the kids start to learn some words and discuss certain ideas. And there is a very nice uh, project, I think it is by Petrov, that she involved the parents as well. So you have the small kids, their parents, and the, uh, and the high schooler as a, as, a, as a guide for the reading club. So there are several ideas, and I think that slowly this is becoming um, part of the authentic uh, classroom. OK, so hopefully for the first activity, this is more, more clear, the different approaches that we are being using for, for teaching uh, heritage languages. And again, you don't have to know all of them, or you don't need to start working with everything, just implementing one of the possible activities to be great. OK, um, let's do the third activity. Mm -hmm. So this activity has to do with goals. Mm -hmm. Let's see if someone has uh, a goal for this year, upcoming year. Yeah. Did you find your goal? Yes, no? Yeah? Uh -huh. For me, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, oh. Bueno, español mejor. Okay, eh, para seguro. mí es muy, muy interesante. Eh, el propósito que yo tengo con mis clases de hispanohablantes es precisamente desarrollarles el, el sentido de, de orgullo de su herencia y del idioma. Y yo veo que si nosotros desarrollamos, empezamos eso como primero, por consecuencia uh -huh. se van a venir los demás. Uh -huh. ¿sí? uh -huh. El alumno va a estar más dispuesto a mantener su idioma, va a estar más dispuesto a, a, a hacer, eh, eh, ¿cómo se dice?, eh, percibir las diferencias culturales, apreciarlas, recibirlas, ¿verdad? Y transferir, ¿verdad?, El, sus conocimientos académicos del inglés al español. Va a haber como que ah, esa actitud de ser positivo va a ser fácil para él. Y si no tiene las acti actitudes académicas, bueno, ese es el segundo, o sea, para mí en segundo nivel sería, uh -huh. porque tomo en cuenta que como en secundaria tenemos mucho estudiante que viene con un nivel académico muy bajo, más bajo, eh, tenemos que desarrollar esos niveles académicos, tenemos que elevarlos. Entonces, el que viene de, el que ha estado en, aquí en Estados Unidos estudiando normalmente, sus habilidades académicas eh, van a ser buenas, van a ser bien. Pero muchos que hablan muy bien el español van a venir muy bajos en lectura, en escritura. Uh -huh. ¿sí? Pero si ellos se sienten, eh, muchos llegan y tratan de, oh, tengo que aprender el inglés para sobrevivir uh -huh. aquí en Estados Unidos. Pero cuando tú les enseñas a que se sientan eh, orgullosos del idioma, ¿sí? están más abiertos a desarrollar el español y inconscientemente ellos van a desarrollar las, las habilidades académicas uh -huh. en inglés también. Entonces, y muchas veces se necesita um, el apoyo de otros, otros, de nuevo, o sea, ninguno de nosotros puede trabajar solo. Entonces, de pronto, quien sea que esté en las clases de inglés, quien sea que sea mentor de los estudiantes, trabajar con esto a través de las lenguas, o sea, son de las dos lenguas. More ideas or your goal for next year? <laughs> I was just going to say, I think my goal is a little bit different just in talking to people. Um, so I can only do one class next year. And so I looked at all of the students we had and I wanted them to be as similar in their level as possible. So I picked only students that have recently arrived mm -hmm. and who have had interrupted schooling. So they need a lot of help with their you know literally literacy skills but they like the maintenance of heritage language i mean that'll be important but that's not my number one because mm -hmm. that's all they got mm -hmm. so i don't know i was just curious is anybody else also teaching primarily immigrant students in your okay it's very different i mean it is very different it's a, it's a so, different challenge i think um so my goals will yeah would just be very different is what i was going to say but um I think that the 
the literacy skills and, and all of that will still be your priority. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be up there. But. And again, I mean, we, I mean, all of these goals are kind of interrelated. They are not just isolated, but normally we try to focus on one and, and, and do different things, trying to promote and, and achieve that goal. And the others are connected and probably they will follow uh, after, hopefully. <laughs> Any other comment or? No? Okay, so let's move to the, to the third part because we are close to uh, lunchtime. I think that is, that is also relevant. <laughs> um, so um, I would like to start with two, uh, two quotes from this year. I think that this year has been very particular for me. I've been collecting data. With, from different, very diverse and different places. But um, both are from, from, one is from March, the other is from May. And I think, okay, um, of course, this is a very small rural school and people just had two, three positions at the same time. And the person uh, was hired actually to be the football, sí, el entrenador de football, uh, for the girls, <laughs> but also because he spoke Spanish, he was given all the Spanish classes from one to pre-AP. Wow. Um, okay, okay, so those are the people that are teaching our students. And then I, uh, I hear, and we were talking, and I heard this, this also second quote, and is, what kind of representation is is working here, okay? That you have to be from Mexico or from Mexican descent in order to be a teacher of heritage learners. So very different quotes, but it gives us some information about who are we, who are the people that are in charge of, this, of these students. So um, what I'm going to show you now is um, partial data of the research I'm, I'm, I'm doing now with a, with a colleague. So not everything is finished up. Hopefully next year we'll have the, all the data completed, but I wanted to know exactly what are the people in front of these classes, what they need to know, and how can we, from the universities and from the research area, help, help with. So core competences, and in here I'm going to be kind of in disagreement with Jose Esteban, because I think that we are not going to be above, of course, I mean, but sociolinguistic this is not working. But sociolinguistic is a, is a fundamental core competence if you're going to teach heritage learners. Uh, you have to know, you have to know sociolinguistic concepts and sociolinguistic data and the information that we can get from the research. And that means knowing about core concepts when the one that we're discussing this morning and you can keep adding more um, as you read and as you go to workshops. Uh, you have to be familiar with processes of language variation, with the different dialects that the Spanish has, and you know, we have 24 countries, how many regions, how many dialects. None of us can be an expert, but at least if you have a student that you know he's coming from uh, Uruguay, okay, just do a little bit of research, check some words, welcome him with an expression that represents that country. And it's a way to start to involve and recognize the variation that you will have in your class because our classes are, uh, by definition, very, very uh, diverse. Um, you have to know a little bit about attitudes and ideology theory uh, because it's the only way to start understanding, analyzing, and they're fighting back, as the cases that we saw before. And then you have to know somewhat what's happening with Spanish chefs in the US because we have several varieties working and there are changes constantly. And I think that the work that uh, is being done by the Observatorio, the Instituto Cervantes in Harvard, one of the main projects is creating a dictionary of Spanish in the US. That will be an excellent tool because you will have like a full dictionary curated, ready to use, and you can just revise the words and say, oh, okay, these words are from our community, this word maybe are, are spoken in Chicago or in Los Angeles or in Nova York. Um, the, other, the other three areas have to do with, first, with your learners and your communities, and 
it takes a while, but you have to become to understand who your students are. And doesn't mean that you know their profiles, uh, the history of the community, where they're coming from. It's very different. They're just migrants that are arriving now, or they are fourth generation, that their families have been here for a very long while. Um, you need to know about their motivations, and it's very easy to run the first few days of classes. You can run an, a survey. Why are you in this class? What you are planning to learn? Uh, what would you like to see? And, and try to understand what motivates them to be. That is not just, okay, I have to be in this class. Uh, and then, again, be familiar and be updated with the cultural, political, historical issues of living in the US. I mean. Thank you. Um, on that note, I, I just want to say that that's so important. I, myself as a teacher, going on my sixth year teaching Spanish now, I first year teaching AP classes. And for those AP students, I'm like, oh, they're in AP, I'm not gonna, I didn't do the survey with them. <laughs> and it's amazing how, what classroom management I had with all the classes, because they were like, oh, she knows about me. There was a rapport. And with my AP students, I'm like, oh, I know why y'all are here. Y'all want to take the test. You, you're in Spanish for, ya saben en español. Vamos a hablar español. Buenas tardes. Salude a todos. Nada de que porque lo están tomando, que quieren hacer. Nada de eso. And it changed the classroom. It really, really, and, and it was an eye opener for me uh, yeah. to, to realize that and to assume that, that oh, ya that. saben, ya están aquí, todos quieren hablar, y, y, y todos son hispanohablantes, y, y ya, yeah. let's go. Yeah. E, e, y no les di esa, and so when I did it second semester, because mm -hmm. I could see it, I could feel it. Um, ya una vez que lo hice en el, en el segundo semestre, ya, ay, maestra, qué clase tan divertida. And, yeah. and they were willing to share, because it, it showed that I care. Yeah. So it's not just a... Uh, you know, as we, we get bond as teachers in the in the routine of like um, warm ups in 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 those uh, icebreakers mm -hmm. in the beginning mm -hmm. of the year, Ikel mm -hmm. icebreaker, because they do it in every class, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, my pre piece, no, yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done with that. You know, that was just me being human too, mm -hmm. but but it it mattered, it mattered, it, it, and if anything, it mattered more to them. Porque querían esa conexión conmigo. Querían saber que yo quería saber de ellos. Yeah. So that, that to me was just like a huge eye opener for just as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a teacher. Because we do. We, we go like every day and, and, sure. and, and not, not catch on that part. Because we look at it differently, I guess. And, and so I just wanted that. That's a really very yeah. important yeah. point yeah, we, that we can't forget because I saw it. It, it matters. And, and it really yeah. matters. It yeah. really matters. <laughs> And I think that we, I mean, uh, I think that that's fundamental, know your learners, but also know the communities. And for instance, how many of you have DACA students? Most of us, if not all. And I know that, I mean, we cannot use the class like a political context and start doing great discussion on this, but we, can, we cannot be like, okay, it's not happening. And try to navigate without having that, and sometimes students are not responding because they are absolutely afraid, and what's happening at their homes, we don't know, but somewhat you have to create a group of people in your institution, and in the university we have different resources, but depending on where you are, you will find that maybe it's another teacher, maybe it's your, it's your principal, uh, and have spaces to discuss these issues and, and give them the opportunity to talk. So we have to be, aware of what's happening in, in the context of our, not only the students, but their communities. Um, then, of course, language pedagogy. Um, this is another fundamental competence for us. And in there, we need to, of course, have some uh, understanding of how the different processes of language occurs in our minds regarding first language, second language, heritage language acquisition, because the three processes work kind of together with heritage learners. Uh, you have to be able to do like a error analysis and needs analysis very fast in the first days of class, so you can really change your curriculum, 
according with these students, this particular group of need, uh, the students need. So that's like something that you have to learn how to do. Uh, we just discussed five seconds of new pedagogical perspective. You can become more familiar, reading more, accessing the data that we're offering. And there are many resources now. And the back of the uh, printout handout, you will find a big list. So you have where to start. And then the other, the other topic, there is a, this uh, publication from 2016 that found, based on a CAL survey, that 90% of heritage learners are in Spanish as a second language class, meaning that all of us will have heritage learners in our second language classes, uh, at least for uh, middle school and high school. That means that we're going to be mixed classes, so we need to know how to work with this kind of context of students. Uh, I think that it's fundamental to create an, an, an environment where heritage learners and second language learners can collaborate because both parts, both groups are afraid of each other normally. So you have to create the conditions so they can work together and start building up different skills according to what they need. And finally, and I think that this is like the perfect place, so I'm very, very thankful to Coral for affording us this, this time, that space. We need to keep reflecting in our own experiences, our own background, um, being able to, okay, I can do this already, I can, I can be perfect in sociolinguistic, but I still need to work more in differentiation or, or think, okay, my community, can, how can, can we reach more? Can I do something for the community that implies that my, my learners will be more welcome in my, in my institution? Um, and I think that that's something that slowly has become part of, of the profession, our outside role. And Jennifer Lehman in, in, in Oregon, in a presentation two years ago, said that if you're going to be a teacher of heritage language learners, you have to become an advocacy as well. And that meaning start to work outside the classroom. So uh, I think that all these different points are, are relevant and you can, again, kind of decide the goal for yourself for next year based on this. I want to know more about this, I, I want to try this, and keep growing in the profession. Okay. So very fast, uh, our data. So we have an idea, who are we? Uh, so far we have only one, 115 uh, participants. Um, the field is uh, mostly female, 75%. Uh, they have different levels of teaching experience, and you can see that the division of, of them is, is like 30%, they're beginning to teach, they're uh, gaining experience. 43% have like a middle ground, and only 17% have like a large experience teaching, teaching Spanish and Spanish uh, for heritage learners. Uh, regarding uh, degrees, we have that most of them are MA, which is fantastic. I think uh, Anna, another uh, group is just uh, ABA. I think that those plus are the ones that need more professional development uh, across their, their teaching lives. Uh, there is a, a small group of, uh, of, of doctoral uh, professionals. Um, the third, the fourth line is interesting because just a few of those um, educational plans, BAs, MAs, have a specific training for teaching heritage languages. So that's something that most programs are missing. And we need to start at the university level to reconsider how we're, we're training our future, future teachers. 14% uh, indicated that they have zero preparation for teaching uh, heritage languages. Uh, regarding the languages, I think that this, this is very curious. You have that 56% indicated that Spanish is their first language, 31% uh, the second language, there is a small group, 7%, that indicate that it's the, their third language, but only 6% selected that their heritage language was Spanish. What is the meaning of this? Uh, that we need to promote <coughs> education career well, with our own students, particularly at the high school level, because they will be the perfect professionals. Yeah. So that's something that we need to slowly start to talk with some of them and say, have you thought of 
teach in Spanish as a career, maybe bring uh, brochures from universities that are close by, colleges, and, and promoting the educational path as, as a possible uh, field for them to, to go in. Okay. Um, where are they teaching? Well, um, there are middle school and high school, most of them. 34% at the college level, 17% at elementary, and then other. And I think that with this question, um, they were answering, thinking of just heritage language classes. But I think that most of people are working with Spanish. They will have heritage learners in their classes, regardless of, of, the, of, the, of the level of the class. Uh, what curricula, what are they using to teach? Uh, mostly, they are relying on ACTFL. And I think that ACTFL does a very good job for second language uh, teaching and learning. But if you consider the goals of ACTFL, the five C's that everybody knows, and you consider the goals that we just saw, there is a big difference. Uh, and the competences that you need as a Spanish as a second language uh, teacher is not the same that you would need to be a, a successful heritage learner teacher. So ACTFL is still very heavy in the field and it's, there are things that we can use from them, but the goals and the perspectives are different and you have to be aware of that. Uh, and there is just 18% of the respondents that were using a specific heritage language curriculum in their classes. Uh, again, mixed classes are the norm. 90% teaches uh, mixed, mixed courses. Uh, half of them consider that they have enough preparation to, to work with heritage languages, but 38%, almost half, say the maybe or directly no. So we need more professional developments and continue working on, on this. Uh, and we found that most teachers would like to receive development in areas that have to do with traditional skills and grammar and lex, uh, lexis, vocabulary learning, but there are less interest or maybe less information regarding the new perspectives, like the use of translanguage in the classroom, sociopolitical topics that we can bring as a critical pedagogy proposals, sociolinguistic, teaching with technology, multilateralism. So the new perspectives that universities are proposing are not still uh, going down into the mainstream uh, models, and we need to work on that. What's translanguaging? Mm. Translanguaging means that you are using code switching <coughs> in the class for teaching and for learning. And this all division that, okay, if we speak only Spanish here, and we speak only English here, and it seems like you are divided in half, it does, in the brain it doesn't work like that. We have access to the two or three systems, depending on our, our competences, all the time. And they're online all the time. That's the, the newest research in, 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 at the, at the neuro neurological uh, level. So meaning that you're using the resources that you have available at the time that you're performing. So I, I'm going to, when we are talking about this uh, earlier, I will switch, for instance, even if I'm trying to keep in, in Spanish, I will switch if I had to talk about uh, theoretical topics because all the reading I'm doing at this point are in English. So there are times that it's like, okay, I'm saying it in English and I should see the word in Spanish and use it, but it's faster. So it has to do with how we manage available resources. And it's uh, something that um, Ophelia Garcia has been written for a, for a period of time. I think that her first article was 2002. And there is a book in 2008 from her that is, I mean, work with that. But you can, you can look it up and there are information. And an activity that I saw, I say, okay, this is very smart. Uh, an elementary school, they have migrant children that spoke Spanish, have some reading skills, and they have a group that were heritage learners, they were more proficient in English. And in the class, it was like a third, fourth grade, uh, they have to read a, a, a book in English. So the teacher did this. And this is a perfect example of translanguage. Uh, she assigned the kids that were able to read in English to read the, the book at home and do summaries in Spanish. They revised the summaries in, in class, and then the other kids, the ones that were coming from Spanish-speaking countries, read the summaries, and together 
sitting students with the high proficiency in English, high proficiency in Spanish, they discuss topics related to the story. And at the end, each group of, of each pair has to share main ideas that they hold about the characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she used the use of English that this group has, like in a strong language skill, to help the other group, and then together debate on the, on the topics. And that's a translanguage. You are using all the available resources in your class to get meaning. At the end, it's what, what matters what the students were able to get the meaning of the story. OK, and challenges. And this is, I think, our last slide, so almost just in time. And those are some of the comments that we gather. But you can see here, it was a multiple option. They could select as many challenges as they like from a very long list. But we found that, I mean, the most, the most common are, are the fact that we have diverse levels, diverse levels of proficiency, diverse type of students. And that's an important, important challenge. Um, lack of materials came in the third place. So we we're talking about the need to keep working uh, as a group, as a, as, a, as a colleague, creating, developing, trying, um, improving materials so that, that we can use in the classes. Uh, LAVA curriculum, I think that that relates to the uh, use of ACFL as a main way to, to get a curriculum organized. That's something that the, the, the profession has to still to kind of help with that. Time, well, time, I think that this is a challenge for, for everything, for all of us. Um, uh, I think that the, the, the next one has to do with those, um, those teachers that are second language learners of Spanish, and all of a sudden they're sitting or facing students that are native speaker or heritage learners, and they feel that their, their, their skills in Spanish are not up to date, and there are some conflict there. Um, students' low motivation. Again, it has to do with the goals, with attitudes, and what brings the students to the class. Lack of institutional support, there were some answers there. And then the lack of clear standards for, for heritage classes. So, um, and here, I, I fell for the second person, because I, I understand what it means that you have so many students and and trying to get materials, training, support can be uh, exhausting. I think that we overall share this, this experience. Um, and then the, uh, the motivation, the first one, the background in the last one. So there were some, some of the comments regarding uh, challenges. So finally, our last activity. So you have in your, in your uh, digital handout the, the list of challenges. I would like to know if you share the same experiences of these, of these teachers, so you have a very different uh, perspective. Uh, and we know that all share these particular issues uh, across, across the state. Uh, And I'm very interested in see if you have other challenges to add to our list. So the final, the final activity for you is to <coughs> work with someone and find a way to overcome that challenge. And let's take five minutes. We are almost out of time. We don't have much time um, left, but um, this will be your homework <laughs> for next year. <laughs> so next year I'm going to collect it, OK? Uh, you have an action plan. And in a perfect situation, you have more time. And maybe if you feel like doing this over, over lunch, it will be fantastic. Was kind of create your own, based on your goals and the thing that we talk about today, create like an action plan for next year. This is what I want to accomplish and develop like a small step-by-step -step, uh, plan and maybe share it with someone else and, and receive and give feedback. That would be an ideal um, activity to do, but I hope that you do it at home and keep thinking about uh, the topics that we discussed today. And of course, many, many thanks. And OK, I think that lunch is 
and ready. And if you need to contact me, I'm happy to. This is my email. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, that you find it's beneficial to use materials with students that exist in English and Spanish. Was I hearing you mm -hmm, correctly? Mm -hmm. Like Cajas de Carton, La Casa en la Calle Mango. And there are so many, uh, so many right. possible resources, yeah. Right. Um, I, it's Actful encourages the use of authentic resources you know, with L2 students. And how much more with our heritage students, right? Like, I, I feel that, that authentic materials should be... The only materials <laughs> to use. Should be the only materials. And, and, and one of my struggles and hang-ups with, actually, th those two examples I just cited, Cajas de Carton and, mm -hmm. and the House on Mango Street, their versions in Spanish, is the translation can sometimes be really awkward and weird and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like, I started... House on Mango Street in Spanish just for my own reading, and I, I couldn't continue it because the translation was so awkward. And, and so, um, so actually, one of the things, one of the questions I wanted to bring to this conference is um, what authentic novels are some of you reading in your class? Authentic, you know, written in Spanish for a Spanish speaking audience that can be used for high school heritage learners and whatnot. And so, but I, I, I thought that that. Um, so I was kind of surprised to hear that, and, 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 and I think we should constantly seek to put authentic resources no, in no, front of course. And, I mean, and I think that avoid there are, translated works. No, mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking of your, your question on, on, on Mango Street, that of course is written in English, but the experience is our student experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So I will do the following, I will just divide the novel, or part of the novel, and get the student to do the translation in Spanish. And you will have like authentic resources that is your student's version of the novel. Mm -hmm. And you're working with the English uh, authentic material. Mm -hmm. And also there are several others that are working. We're, we're incorporating some of the Juno Diaz, but of course we're at college level, uh, use of Spanglish and, and code switching. So there are many, many different uh, resources. And there is a website in the Library of the Congress. I'm going to, to look it up. Uh, I don't have it here with a, a list of uh, Hispanic authors that you can, you, can, you can look for. So more ideas on this, please. Yeah. Somebody's reading or using um, bilingual production from uh, Latino authors. Um, to answer your, give you an idea of a, of a novel, it's, it's very big, uh, Octavio Paz, El Mexicano. I mean, it, it, the first chapter only talks about self-identity, cómo, cómo se identifica el mexicano, es por Octavio Paz, y es un ensayo de él grandísimo, it's, it's, it's a novel, it's a book, but es un ensayo, básicamente, mm -hmm. de, de, de qué se es el mexicano, qué se celebra, el, y, y tiene, um, habla de, de la identificación, de, de, ser, de ser esa persona, y, y Y yo al leerlo dije, sí, es eso yo. Y dije, yo voy a darles por lo menos tres, cuatro páginas de, de libro que, que, uh -huh. que me gustaron mucho y, y, y lo copié. Uh -huh. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> for educational purposes. <laughs> power <laughs> scenes, power <laughs> scenes. <laughs> y, 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 lo, 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 en, y lo hice y se los di a ellos que lo leyeran. Sí. Y dijeron, ¿quién es él? ¿Quién es esta persona? Y dije, ah, es uno de sus estudiantes, es uno de sus compañeros que escribió esto. And they were looking around trying to figure out who did it. Y les dije, pero no hoy, lo hizo años atrás. And so the, y se llama Octavio Paz. And so that's how I introduced the author. And then they were like, oh, wow. Y hay más, maestra, hay más autores mexicanos o cubanos. And so you, you gain their interest. Um, but that he's a good one. That, that, that essay by him, it's a novel. Mm -hmm. I would like to plug one author. Um, I, I don't get much opportunity to, to use these, this, these, these kind of books in my classes. I use them all more at home. But it's looking at the literature that is written for young adolescents. We don't always have to read, you know, adult level, college level, to have a really nice story. <clears throat> and I, I came across a woman named Paloma Muña. 
she's um, from Madrid. And she has a, a series of, well, not a series, but several, several books that, that are written for different age groups, like upper elementary, junior, and, and high school, so that they fit into that young adolescent literature. But Paloma Muina, and the stories are wonderful. Some of them are really heavy in dialogue, so you can, you know, even though it's, it's written, you can kind of still get a feel for um, like Spanish, Span you know, it's Spaniard youth exchange. So, M U I N Y A, Muina. Paloma Muina. M U I N Y A. And Arte Público Press uh, normally edits bilingual books. Uh, and they, they have a very nice collection for children books, and you can just search. Um. And then we can't we can ignore it, Dailan Kivki. You have to read that. <laughs> With a map. <laughs> OK, I think. Uh, oh, sorry, I have a couple of suggestions of um, for things that I have used with my students. Um, for example, I like Gary Soto, um, Tardes de Baseball. So these are all short stories. Gary Soto, okay, that's the name of the, I also, I, I've also used um, the, the ones by uh, Julia Alvarez, La Tia Lola. La Tia Lola viene de visita, La Tia Lola regresa. Um, they, they are both in English and Spanish. And those are very nice because uh, you look at the differences in generations. Um, so uh, it's a story of this woman who is uh, Dominican and came, comes to the U.S. to live with their ki her kids. It's especially good for uh, people in, on the East Coast. And then it's uh, how the kids are growing up in the United States and how you know there are differences, generational differences. And you see that throughout, you know, um, 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 the the whole story and then how you know it's it's a question of finding a balance between, you know, who they are, the kids, and then the, the, the mother. And then here comes someone from La Tia Lola, from the Dominican Republic, and then how things progress from uh, uh, that. That's, that's the whole story. And then there's um, um, a lot of the bilingual poems, that, uh, too. You know, I use a lot of Gustavo Perez Irmat. Um, his bilingual poems are wonderful. They have to do with identity, too. Uh, also. Um, there's a great anthology of uh, Latino uh, literature that was published a couple of years ago uh, by this guy. I don't remember. Um, I don't like him. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, his, his uh, what is his? Uh, Stavans. Um, yeah, he, uh, I don't like him, but the anthology is very good. And then, of course, um, there are uh, translations, of, but you can always use them in English to, you know, Juno Diaz. And the new book by Juno mm -hmm. Diaz has two. Uh, versions, Lola, and then also uh, it's for kids, but it's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to use it in my in my class. Um, it's a mixed class, um, writing class that I was telling you about. So there are tons of um, of options out there, and uh, and um, and there's a lot of going on. I mean, here in in, in Texas, um, there are a lot of wonderful things. Um, there's one that is called um, an anthology. Um, is the name of that anthology? I can see that. Um, I think it's um, something in Texas. But anyways, I can share those, this information. I put it in the folder mm -hmm. yeah. for you guys. Yeah. So, okay. We need to go to lunch. But one more comment. Okay. Yeah, I know. Um, thinking, thinking about a lot of the statements where you want to turn this into project learning or service learning, something that my colleague at Indiana University and I do is we have a program called Translate for Toddlers because we wanted to bring the trans language into the classroom and she's in French. So we um, partnered with Better World Books and a bunch of um, donation centers and we um, are given children's books in English which we then take into our classrooms and we talk about the problems of, of translation, literary translation, what is the American Translation Association, and we have a lot of mixed classes with a lot of, of skilled heritage learners. And we translate the books to Spanish or, or French mm -hmm. right into the book 
and then they are gifted to, we um, have, we handle 22 counties of migrant workers. So they're gifted into the school programs. But the discussion goes on to find out that many of the um, heritage learners did not read children's books. They did not have these. And so now we're giving them to the community so that um, children that need them will have bilingual books because bilingual books are expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have an entire translation program that then does the service learning yeah, that perfect. way. Yeah. Gracias. Okay, so thank you so much, Flavia. And uh, lunch was supposed to be 12 to 1, so we're going to have a sh shorter lunch because we don't want to stay till 6 tonight. So, um, so if you are not finished eating, feel free to bring your lunch in here and we can try to get started just a little after 1. Um, thank you, everyone. And we can keep the conversation going later. There will be a question and answer session at the very end. So save your questions if you still have more.